over the last few weeks, we've been studying about the life of Jesus Christ. In there, we saw very clearly that Jesus is indeed God, and we talked about his death and his resurrection. Jesus Christ, before he died, or rather when he was on earth, God on earth, <clears throat> he made very clear to men that I will die, and I will arise three days later. To say that I will die is no big deal, right? We're all going to say I will die one day. But to say after three days, by which time my body should have been rotten, I will come, my blood would have clogged up, would have dried up, I will come back to life. It's a declaration that can only be made by the divine God himself on earth. The deity of God was proven by that. The resurrection of Christ is very important because, why? Because if Christ did not arise, then our faith is in vain. We believe in a dead saviour. What's the point? But that he arose, he proved to men that he is God. The power of life and death is in his hand and that he came to die for our sins. <clears throat> his work has been completed, received by God. Right? Death and resurrection, very important. Now then at this point, we also look at page 65 first. Now, there are three days, right? Three days. Christ said, I'll be three days. I will arise on the third day. The first day of crucifixion is which day? Friday, right? Friday. The second day? Saturday. The third day. The Lord says on the third day, He will arise. Third day is Sunday. Sunday. The Lord resurrected on Sunday. Now, after His resurrection, He appeared to His disciples many times. Many times. And the disciples that were fearful, that deserted Him, after the resurrection, when they met the resurrected Christ, they became fearless, correct? They became fearless. They were no longer afraid. They courageously went forward to preach the gospel. Now, what, what caused the change because of the resurrection? They saw the resurrected Christ and they no longer fear death. Do you fear death? Do you fear death? Very often, Christians have many fear. Well, many people fear death. But when they saw that one day they would have the resurrected body, as Christ promised, having witnessed the resurrected Christ, two things, ha two things happened to them. Number one, like I said, they were transformed to be fearless Christians. Number two, they lived then for that resurrection, no longer for the present life, which is temporal. So that changed them. So when we study the resurrection of Christ, it must change you. Does it change you? Have it ch has it changed you? All the while you know about the resurrection of Christ, have you now become fearless? Or you have still of little faith, faithless in your walk? Have you become a Christian that live for that future life? Or still clawing and gr uh, grabbing on to this temporal life? instead of that future resurrected life. So that is what we must learn from this. Then on the third day, he arose. Now, on the third day, he arose was Sunday. At this point, we have to clarify one thing that is important for our faith because our faith and our practice is based on God's word, right? Do we worship on Saturday like the Old Testament people? Uh, on the seventh day is the Sabbath day in the Old Testament, the seventh day, all right, which is what we call today Saturday. Or do we worship on Sunday, which is the first day of the week, the seventh day or the first day? Old Testament was, Sabbath was on Saturday. Do we worship on Saturday or Sunday? There is a group of cults. They are called the Seventh-day Adventists, all right, Seventh-day Adventists. They are also present in, in many countries, in Perth also, Seventh-day Adventists. One of their key teaching is that Christians must not worship on Sunday, but must keep the Sabbath on Saturday, like in the Old Testament. What do you think? What do you think? After the Lord resurrected on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, correct? So Sunday is called the first day of the week. Just to make sure I <coughs> you follow. So Old Testament on the Old Testament. On the seventh day, 
Saturday. <coughs> the Lord resurrected on the, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. <coughs> One thing that we notice <coughs> in the New Testament is that in the New Testament is that <coughs> by practice, the disciples <coughs> naturally were found together on, on this day. <coughs> when, <coughs> very often when the Lord appeared to them, the Lord appeared to them on the first day of the week. And they were found gathered together. Now it's very, uh, let's read scriptures now. Turn your BBK book to page 66, I think. <coughs> page 66. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> page 66. Now from all available records, can you see that, chap that paragraph? From all available records, we find Christian church observing Sunday as the day of worship and rest. How do we know that? Now Matthew, Mark and Luke. The, gospel, the Gospels in these verses record that Jesus Christ arose on the first day of the week. Okay, so the Gospel recorded He arose on the first day of the week. And then you turn with me, or rather, there is <coughs> X. Can you read X 20 verse 7? It's printed there for you. Shall we read together? And upon the first day <coughs> of the week, <coughs> when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Now, in the New Testament, we began to see that the disciples came together on the first day of the week. We, see, we read it very clearly, on the first day of the week. And in that, in that gathering, they broke bread and Paul preached to them. What is breaking of bread, CP? What is breaking of bread? Not sure. Right. Breaking of bread in the Bible often refers to the Holy Communion. They gathered together, they broke bread. The Holy Communion, like we will have the Holy Communion today, right? The breaking of bread. <clears throat> so they observed the Holy Communion. They were observing the Holy Communion together as disciples of Christ. This is a big group. <clears throat> the second thing that was occurring at that time in this gathering was Paul was preaching to them. Paul was preaching to them. That's the preaching, that's the breaking of bread. <clears throat> Why do they gather for this? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 16, verse <clears throat> Now, first, let's read verse um, 1 and 2 together for connection sick. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Right, please share your Bibles. We're now reading. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now here the Apostle Paul wrote to the church and he told them, just like I've told the Galatian churches, now you Corinthian churches do this. On the first day of the week, make your collections for the saints. You see some of the other churches, they were, they were having persecutions and they were, they were not having sufficient provisions in life. So churches were helping each other in different places. So they were like giving to mission work, like we do today. So Paul says, collect those, the things that you want to give to the other churches, in the other places, the Christians that are suffering. When you gather on the first day of the week, make your collection there. What, if, what it means would be, naturally at that time, it seems the biggest gathering of the week. That is the best time to make the collections, correct? That's why I say, don't collect here and there, collect here and there, collect here and there. You pre-collect at that gathering, which is the biggest gathering. And when did that biggest gathering happen of, for the saints? On the first day of the week. So, we see a transition very clearly. A transition from 
Sabbath on Saturday, seventh day, to the first day of the week after the Lord's resurrection. That is why from that, that time on, the, the ancient church, the New Testament church, has always followed that practice, gathering on the first day of the week. Now, one of the things that we have to learn about reading scriptures is this. There are things that in scriptures are clearly stated. Do this. Don't do this, right? There are things that are inferred. That is how God does it. So those seven-day Adventists, they say that God did not give the command, do not worship on the seventh day anymore. I command you to worship on the first day. If God did not give that command, therefore we should continue worshipping on the seventh day. Now, if they were really, the Christians in the New Testament, were gathering together to worship on the seventh day, on the seventh day, do you think Paul would have said, on the seventh day, when you gather, make, take your collection? He would have said that, right? But that Paul said on the first day, it is already a natural transited practice. When we read the Bible, some things are just stated that is, it is stated they gathered on, on the first day. Is the, the Bible state that they gather for breaking of bread, for preaching on the first day? The Bible said that. So we must read scriptures that way. <clears throat> Let me ask you, <clears throat> did Christ specifically say, from now on, the, the Passover will be replaced by the Holy Communion. Did he say that? He did not say that. But we always, we stop having the Passover. Why? Because we know the Passover has been replaced by the Holy Communion. But did Christ say, from now onwards, this is what you will do? No. The Bible simply tells us, Paul simply tells us, the Lord gave it to me, and let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read that today, right? Every, every Holy Communion, we read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, verse 23 and 24 and so on. Now, Paul simply says, For I have received of the Lord that which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, and so on and so on, right? This is the institution of the Lord's Supper. Did, did Paul say, as the Lord have, have delivered to me to replace the Passover with the Holy Communion? Paul didn't say that. He didn't say that. But we knew that on the night the Lord did that, we infer from then onwards the Passover has stopped and been replaced by the Holy Communion without an explicit command. But the practice itself tells us, follow this. Do this from now onwards, correct? Do this from now onwards. That's it. So that is how we read scriptures. Just because scripture did not specifically say that doesn't mean that we cannot infer by practice this is commanded from now onwards. We just do that. If not, what should we do? If the Seventh-day Adventists insist that the past, we must um, worship the Lord on the seventh day, then they should also make sure that they keep the Passover, right? Means every, sun, every Saturday, they still need to, when they want to have um, the remembrance of the Lord, they need to bring all the animals to church, and then the pastor will have to slaughter the animals, and they have to slaughter the animals, and the blood all over the place, right? We don't do that, because by inference, we knew it has been replaced. Okay? So we must understand that. The gatherings were very, very explicit. The maximum gathering for breaking of bread, for preaching of the word, was on the first day of the week. Okay, so I hope that your faith will be sound and clear. Because sometimes Christians begin to wonder, yeah, maybe they are right, we should worship like the Old Testament on Saturday. But it has been replaced. Otherwise, you have to keep the Passover as well. Do circumcision as well. The Lord administer it differently now. Okay, so that is the Lord's Day. And we've completed that, now we move to the new chapter. If you have any questions, you can ask me on the side. Lesson number seven, please turn to lesson number seven, the new birth. The new birth. <coughs> mm. 
right? The new birth. Um, actually, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 3, please. John chapter 3. Gospel of John chapter 3. Okay, let's read from verses 1 to 7. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Shall we commence reading? John chapter 3, verse 1, reading. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. God bless the reading of his word. Nicodemus, the Bible tells us, was a ruler of the Jews. <clears throat> what does it mean? It means he was someone who ruled the Jewish community at that time, the Jews were under the Roman law. But the Romans let them have their own synagogue, their own, their own religious practices and worship and their own um, so-called life as a community. So they themselves had rulers. So these were <clears throat> especially religious rulers, all right? <clears throat> as religious rulers, they are appointed as religious rulers because they know the Word of God. They know the Bible especially the Old Testament. They knew it, and they were, as rulers, always teaching the people what God says, guiding them on how to live according to Jehovah's laws, okay? So, that, so he, was a, he was such a person, a Pharisee, a man of the Pharisees. So he, he policed the people in terms of their living according to God's word. So he was a religious figure in the community, a well-known one. And then he came to Jesus at night, Remember then, the Pharisees, they hated Jesus Christ. But this particular Pharisee called Nicodemus, he saw Jesus Christ performing the miracles, and he knew that this cannot be an ordinary prophet, an ordinary man, not even a great prophet. This is someone that is beyond all this. He wanted something from Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus Christ is not mere man. In his heart, he knew that this is very likely the Son of God. The Pharisees knew that one day the Son of God will come. He came at night. Why do you think he came at night? <clears throat> because he didn't want the rest of the Pharisees to get upset with him, right? The rest of the Pharisees didn't like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was taking the limelight from them. He came by night. <clears throat> now, in verse 3, <clears throat> he came by night. Before he said anything, Jesus Christ cut to the chase. Jesus Christ just cut to the chase and say, he looked at Nicodemus, this is late at night, huh? secret meeting. He's just cut to the chase, verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, say, indeed, surely, right, pay attention. I say to you, Nicodemus, except, without exception, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Friday night, those of you who were here, we talk about the, see, first the kingdom of God, what is it? To be part of God's kingdom means to be going to heaven, all right? Now, the Lord knew what was Nicodemus' heart, why he's coming to him at night. Why is this nighttime meeting, secret nighttime meeting about? He knew in Nicodemus' heart, Nicodemus wanted a particular answer. And he answered it without Nicodemus asking, why can Jesus do that? Because he's God. He already knew the thoughts of Nicodemus. He's omniscient. And he told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I know what you want to ask. I'll just tell you the answer before you ask. Nicodemus, except, 
Now, Nicodemus, you want to know how to get into the kingdom of God, how to be saved, how to have eternal life. So Nicodemus, I just tell you straight away, you must be, accept a man, anyone, anyone, not just you, Nicodemus, accept a man be born again. Accept, and he cannot, means there is no exception. Outside of being, outside of being, outside of being born again, he cannot, cannot, you cannot be saved. You cannot go to heaven unless you are born again. So now, today, you must then know, do you want to go to heaven? Maybe you have that question in your heart. That is why you're here today. And Christians, you've been a Christian a long time. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Because God says, unless you're born again, just because you come to church, just because you're born in a Christian family, just because you've been reading the Bible, just because you even do things in church, serve in church, you read the Bible on your own, just because you do that, if you are not born again, you cannot go to heaven. You are not going to heaven, no matter whatever it is. Notice, God, Jesus Christ did not say, Nicodemus, unless a man read the Bible, pray, come to church, serve me, he cannot go to heaven. No. He said, unless a man be born again. Born again. Are you sure how you are safe? Are you sure? Very often people say, are you a Christian? Over time, Christians began to ask, are you a born-again Christian? Why? Because many profess to be Christians, but they're not saved. They do not know how they're saved. Neither do they care. To them, it's just a religion. It's a family religion. I just like to be Christians. I like to be Christians. That's all. I like to be called a Christian. I like to write in my form, Christian. That is all. Are you born again? In the Holy Communion, I will always ask, is there any born again believer who has observed the sacrament of the Holy Communion. I do not ask, is there any Christian? A born again believer. All right? That is how we get this term. Born again. Now look further down. It's Christ summarized. Verse 7. Now marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. Are you born again? Maybe ask, Hazel, are you born again? What does it mean to be born again? Born again means belief. Means belief in Jesus. Alright? Are there people in this world that you say, do you believe in Jesus? They say, yes. And also, this God and that God and this God and that God and this God. Right? I believe in many. As long as they claim to be God, I believe. Jesus claimed to be God, I also believe. Hmm? Are they saved? They're not born again. But we just said, if you believe in Jesus, you're born again. What does born again mean? Nicodemus, in verse 4, his question will explain to us what born again means. Alright? Now, when Nicodemus heard that, Nicodemus asked the Lord Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Okay? What do you think Nicodemus is asking? Do you think Nicodemus is, is really asking, all right, Lord, I'm this old man with beard and elderly. How can I crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? If I don't do that, I cannot be born again. My mom is dead. So look like I need to dig her up and hope she's not rotten. Right? And climb into her womb. And then crawl back out. Then I can be saved. Do you think Nicodemus is asking that? Do you think so? Would you ask that? <laughs> Alright, Isaac, how old are you, Isaac? Seven. Seven. Isaac is seven years old and he said, no, I won't ask that. Because it is a ridiculous thing to be asking how do I crawl back in and come back out now remember Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews he was a ruler he's not an idiot he's not a stupid man he's made a ruler of the Jews means the rulers see the people see him as a very intelligent wise man therefore they make him a ruler over them okay 
If he really asked that, they make Isaac a ruler <laughs> instead of him. He would not have been asking that. So what was he asking? What was he asking when he said that? It's not a stupid question. When he asked that, the Lord Jesus, how did the Lord answer? The Lord answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now the Lord answer, answers Nicodemus' question. The Lord understood. The Lord is not saying, Nicodemus, why are you so stupid? The Lord answered. The Lord says two things. Now, first of all, born again means born of water. Right? And born of the Spirit. Correct? So now we know, born again, as the Lord answered, is, must consist of these two things. That is what it means to be born again. He was answering Nicodemus directly. Now, what is Nicodemus asking? Look at verse 4. How can a man be born again, be born when he is old? So now he says old. 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 And then he says, the second question he's asked, and be born. Be born. How, how can old be born? Be born again. Two questions. Two questions and the Lord gave two answers. So Christian, you say I am a born again believer. Jeremy, are you a born again believer? Okay, so you must be able to explain what it means to be born again. What does it mean? <coughs> Believe that Jesus is that Jesus is one and only God. What else? And how are you saved? I am saved and my salvation, I'm saved by grace. Okay? Only God by grace. I'm a born again believer because I believe that Jesus Christ is the only true and living God. The only way to heaven, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Correct? So this is the only way to get to heaven. So you believe that. So one. Number two, you believe that you're saved by grace. What does it mean by saved by grace? Saved by grace means? Means what? Brenda, what does it mean saved by grace? Where's grace? Grace is here? Grace, where are you? Grace is not here this morning. You're saved by grace. Grace Lou. How you are saved? What does it mean saved by grace? You're undeserving and God graciously save you, rescue you. He graciously rescue you when you're undeserving. Undeserving, nothing you can do to save yourself. Because there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, God says there's nothing you can do. So I graciously come to this world and pay for your sins. Grace, that is what it means. The opposite of grace is what? Works. I save myself. By my own works, I can save myself. Grace means you humbly tell God, God, I can't save myself. I'm a sinner. Nothing I can do to cover my sins. Please save me. Gracious, be gracious to me. Be merciful, right? That is what it means. So God gave these two answers. You're correct. Uh, sorry, but what does it mean? Born of water, born of spirit. How is it this? What is born of water? What do you think? Baptism. baptism. Okay, so one says baptism. Was the thief on the cross baptized? No. no. Did Jesus promise him that he'll be in heaven? Yes. So can it be baptism? Probably not. But it sounds very like, right? Baptism. Okay, sounds like, sounds like that. When the, whenever we read scriptures, we cannot jump to conclusions. We have to see the word being used across scriptures. I say again, when we read scriptures, when we see a word, we should always understand how the word is used across scriptures. If we just look at one aspect, 
it can be dangerous. Okay? Now, if, whenever we say water, water, we think of baptism, correct? We think of baptism. By the way, do you know in the Old Testament, the people were also baptized, okay? Baptizo. They were also baptized. They were baptized with what? The blood of animals. They would put the blood of animals on the hyssop, they would sprinkle. That is to them cleansing. So water, does the Bible always use water to refer to baptism? Sorry, you are Hannah. Hannah. Now, so Hannah, does the Bible always use the word water because Jesus came out of the water of the baptism? Right? So naturally, a lot of us think that baptism is what saves us. Water, is it always baptism? Let's refer. Now, the Bible uses the word water for something else too. For something else too. Can we turn um, to the book of Ephesians? Chapter 1. Okay, let's Ephesians chapter 5 first. Ephesians chapter 5. Can we read verse 26 together? Ephesians 5 verse 26. Reading. That he might present it to himself. Uh, sorry, sorry. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The Bible also used the word cleansing, washing with water. And what is this water? Hannah. The word. The Bible also refers to word like water. Why? Because water washes, right? Washes, washes. So the word washes us of our sin. Now what does it mean? So how? Word washing us with the sin. Word washing us with sin means we take Bibles, we burn them, we dissolve in water and then we shower in it. Does it mean that? No, the washing of the water by the word means the, when you receive the word of God, you believe it, then you are washed. Understand? How are you washed of your sins? I read the Bible and the Bible tells me that Jesus is the only God. I read the Bible and the Bible tells us that I cannot be saved by being a good person. I am saved purely by the grace of God. I need to depend on His grace alone. I read the Bible and I believe that. Now, because I read the Bible and I believe that, it is like water that washes away my sins. Understand? That is what it means. So the water is also referred to as, as the Word. So how, how is God answering this? How is born of water means you must believe my word. How is this linked to being old? How is it linked? How do you think? Uh, I want to try. Susan, how is being... He asked, I'm old. Then Christ said, okay, you must be born of water. You must believe the word. How is it linked? Okay, no time. I have to answer. Say again. Very good. I have believed in something for a long time. He's a teacher of the Jew. I've always believed in something for a long time. Now are you telling me at this old age, I need to believe whatever you say? Do you understand that? That's why Christ said, You're, he said I'm old already. He said, difficult to teach old dogs, right? New tricks. I'm old. You mean you expect me to be like, crawl back into my mother's womb and pretend that I'm like a new baby that came out all over again and start to... Babies need to learn from what? From scratch, correct? He said, are you telling me at my old age, I need to be like a baby learning from scratch all over again in order to be saved? Yes. That's why Christ said, Yes. Now, from now onwards, you must believe what I say, not what you have always thought will bring you to heaven. What you always have thought in your mind. Now, that's why you look, you turn back to John. Is it about learning? How do we verify that this is indeed about learning? Turn back to John chapter 3. Okay, John chapter 3 now. Look at verse, 
Let's read verse 10 together. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? You are a master of Israel. You're supposed to be teaching Israel how to be saved. You claim to be a master, but you don't know these things? Is it linked with knowledge? It's about knowledge. Understand? Old, what you've learned. Born of water, the word. It is about knowledge. The knowledge of how you are saved. You see, until then, the Jews have been mistaken. Over time, they got corrupted and they began to think that the sacrifices obeying the law will save them. Understand? So, so the Pharisees were beginning to teach them, you must obey this, obey that, obey this, obey that in order to be saved. But Jesus says, no, you are saved by grace, not by all these things. Do you understand? So that is what it means, not baptism. Okay, not baptism. And now, once and for all, because baptism, it will be by works, not by grace anymore. Not baptism. So washing of the water by the word. So in other words, now, then born of the Spirit, the day you believe and you say, Lord, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I can't depend on my works. And Lord, I have always been told by my family, my friends, by this world, that being a good person will save me. I need to unlearn all those things now. I need to now believe in what you say. So Hannah, you say, I believe in Jesus, means you believe everything that Jesus says. Right? That is what it means. So, Christians, I ask you, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. You've been thinking that I am going to heaven because I have been a good Christian. By my good Christian behavior, I will go to heaven. No. You need to unlearn all that. You need to learn today, forget all those things, I am, uh, I am going to heaven because Jesus Christ died for my sins and I turn to him in repentance and ask him to be gracious to save me. That is where it starts, born again. And when you believe that, the Lord Jesus says, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you, saved by the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes and convicts you, tells you Jesus Christ is God, the only God. Do you believe? If you say, I believe Jesus is God and also the other gods are other gods. But Jesus Christ, Christ said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you believe? No, nope, I cannot because all the time, I'm older, all the time I believe that. Then you need to be like Nicodemus. I need to unlearn all that. Now I believe. And when you do, the Lord says, He will grant you the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. The Holy Spirit saves you through the word, okay? Now, in other words, I want to draw this. Then we go to end and prepare for worship. Next week, we will ask this question. We answer this question. What is the meaning of belief? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, anyone, whosoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. What does it mean to believe? But first today we understand this. Being born again is at one point in time. At one point in time. You tell the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know that you are the only and true living God. And I'm a sinner. I know that my works cannot save me. You came to die for my sin. Please forgive me and save me by your grace. The point you say that, at this point, you are born again. Because you have forgotten, you ignore everything that you have learned until this age. I'm old, I learned all these things, but now I forget them. I believe your word, what you say. I want to be cleansed by your word. Save me by your grace. At this point in time, you are born again. You will have the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Point of time. It is not, born again is not this. Born again is not, now listen carefully, please. Born again from the Bible is not, use another color. Born again is not, I obey God. I read the Bible, I come to church, I get baptized, I do all these things, and then at some point in time, I get born again. BA, Bachelor of Arts, okay? 
The most important BA is be born again, not your bachelor's. Born again is at one point of time you ask God to save you. It is not I obey and then at some point of time I've obeyed well enough. Now I am born again. Understand that, huh? After you are born again, you obey. You obey the Lord because you are born again. You do not obey God in order to be born again. You obey God because you are born again. Understand the sequence very clearly. Friends, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you have to ask yourself, am I born again? Or have I been depending on being a good Christian and hope to get to heaven? Then you need to unlearn everything you have learned to this age. Okay? So I hope you understand what it means to be born of the water. Believe in the word completely, totally. Otherwise, you can't be washed. Receive the Holy Spirit. Ask, him, ask God to save you, and He will give you the Holy Spirit. Okay? At this point of time, have you? Have you been born again? The Lord asked the same question. Let us pray.